You're listening to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin, and this is the podcast where you will get expert advice about the heavy duty parts you buy and keep you informed about what's happening in the industry. This episode is sponsored by Full Bay. If you own or operate a heavy-duty repair shop, you should check out this game-changing cloud-based solution. And you really can have it all. Efficient techs, faster invoicing, better inventory tracking, and more time with your family. To learn more, go to fullbay.com slash HDPR. That's fullbay.com slash HDPR. PR today. It's not if something will go wrong, it's when something goes wrong. You ever heard that before? Your sure. business your business could be like a rocket ship and it could be growing exponentially and the good times seem like they're never going to end until of course they do. Or your business might be spiraling out of control and it seems like nothing you do is going to improve the situation. And you might be asking yourself, are we ever going to get out of this slump? As leaders of businesses, we are definitely responsible for making the tough decisions. And we rely on our own past experiences and we make judgment calls all the time. But what if the decisions we're making are leading us towards disaster? And what if there was something going on behind the scenes that maybe we weren't even aware of that was causing us to make poor decisions? And is there something that we could do to help us to avoid that if at all possible? Well, to help us answer all of these questions, I would like to introduce Dr. Gleb Serposky, CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. Gleb, welcome to the podcast. Jamie, thank you so much for having me on, and I really appreciate that great intro. Now, we've seen some very large and once very successful businesses close their doors in the past few years. An example of that is Celadon. That's a heavy duty trucking fleet that just shut down, and mm. they were a big company. Now, how does that happen? How does a company go from that size and that much success to closing its doors? <laughs> well, ask uh, Boeing in a few years and we'll see what happens, right? Companies make bad decisions all the time. And unfortunately, companies like Celadon, which is actually not too far from me. I mean, I'm based, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. So it was in, in Indianapolis. So not too far from me at all. It's kind of the next state over. It's five hours driving distance. And I had, I know some people who are influenced by that, impacted by that right here in Columbus, Ohio. So what happens with those sorts of situations? Well, that was sort of a special case and there were some internal corruption going on from what I recall. And that happens unfortunately regularly enough that you'd be surprised and unfortunately unpleasantly surprised by how often companies undergo revelations of internal corruption when they don't have enough internal controls when they don't have enough people who are actually looking at what's going on and when people are making bad decisions when their company culture doesn't promote loyalty so that all has to do with company culture and we greatly underestimate the role of culture emotions feelings in act in shaping our decisions. You know what the recent research on this topic shows? It shows that about 80% of our decision-making is influenced by our gut emotions, gut feelings, gut reactions. And so when you don't feel invested in a company, you can start doing some pretty unpleasant stuff to the company if you are in a position to do so. And of course, that's just one category of bad decisions that can take place, but that's what happened to Celadon, what brought that down. So. That is something that we need to be very much aware of and worried about and focusing on understanding where bad decisions are coming from that are caused by our impulses, by our emotions, by our gut reactions. We're so often told to just go with our gut. In fact, that's the most common business advice in terms of decision making that you'll hear. Unfortunately, our gut reactions, like you said at the beginning in the intro, cause us to make some pretty terrible decisions and results in bankruptcies like Celadon, which was well, kind of a malicious, deliberate situation, or very, very bad decisions like what's happening with Boeing right now. Very bad decisions by the leadership, of course, unintentional bad decisions that led to the terrible situation of 346 people losing their lives and Boeing being out at last count 
it's uh, over 10 million it has had in direct costs and of course its reputation its credibility its market cap i mean the market capitalization of boeing is over 30 billion less because of the indirect cost of reputation and trust. So you, a lot of the bad decision-making is not intentional. It's not malicious. It's unintentional. Most of the bad decision-making is unintentional and it leads to just as bad of a disaster in some ways. So I know in, in preparing for today's conversation, I know that you talk a lot about cognitive biases and biases of any kind usually are not particularly obvious to the person who has them. So how do we identify them? You need to identify where you have specific patterns that cause you to make bad decisions. Cognitive biases specifically refer to the patterns of bad decision making that cognitive neuroscientists and behavioral economists have identified as common typical patterns. Most of us have a bunch of them. We all have some of them. For example, we all tend to be overconfident to some degree or another. So there's really interesting study that, that shows that if people say they are 100% confident in something. If they would bet the career, bet, bet their house, you know, they're usually about 80% of the time they'll be right. 20% of the time they'll be wrong. They'll lose their career, they'll lose their house. So that's su super strong certainty actually often is not accurate. Confidence is one of the biggest problems we have. We feel confident. It often is not the case that what we're confident in is true. So overconfidence bias is something that all of us experience to some extent, but there are a whole set of other biases that we, some of us experience. So for example, for myself, one of the biggest ones for me is the optimism bias. The optimism bias is kind of like it sounds. I tend to be much more optimistic than should be the case. So that makes me more cheery, more excited about things, when those things actually may not be very exciting, when those things may be bad ideas. I'm kind of risk blind. I think a lot of ideas are great that may not be very great. I get excited about things. And uh, I also have higher expectations than is actually the case than I should have. You know, I think the, grease and the grass is green on the other side of the hill, whereas it actually should be yellow. So this is a big problem for me. And this is something that you need to learn about. What are the problems for you as an individual? What kind of patterns of bad decision-making do you suffer from by learning about cognitive biases and seeing which ones are a problem for you? That's very interesting because in some respects, I would share that same trait with you. Mm. But on the other side, uh, is it possible that you could be biased in a negative way to the point where you're actually seeing things for, you know, worse than they actually are? Like, can it yes. go both ways? Absolutely. It's a spectrum. So that's called the opposite. It's called the pessimism bias, right? An intuitive name in this case, optimism bias and the pessimism bias. My wife is actually has a strong case of the pessimism bias where she's risk averse. She thinks that things will go poorly. She thinks the grass is yellow on the other side of the hill when it's actually green. She's very, she sees a lot of things as much riskier than they are. And that makes it sometimes difficult for us to collaborate. When you kind of, when you have two optimistic people together, you just have a whole bunch of ideas and you support each other. When you have two pessimistic people, you just commiserate with each other in misery and how about how terrible the world is. When you have an optimistic person and a pessimistic person, that's where you tend to butt heads a lot <laughs> and you have conflicts and you have fights. And that's a big problem. Now, what I learned from the research on cognitive biases about how you can collaborate better with people who are pessimistic, who have a different opposite bias than I do, whether in business situations or in life situations. What you want to do is you want to have separate the process of coming up with ideas and evaluating the ideas. You know, I have 20 brilliant ideas before breakfast or so I think they're brilliant. Then I hang them off to my wife, who is my business partner, and she evaluates them. She says, you know, of these 20 half baked potatoes, maybe these three are worth finishing baking. So let's work on these three ideas. And she's great at improving things. She's very bad at coming up with ideas because she intuitively sees all the flaws in her own ideas and she shuts them down before they can be made into better ones. And so as a result, she doesn't, she's not great at generating ideas, but she's great at improving them and taking them to a finished condition. So that's a wonderful way for optimists and pessimists to work together in teams, in personal relationships, whatever. That's a great way for them to work together. And in fact, you have the strongest teams when you have diff people with different cognitive diversity on the team, optimists and pessimists, as opposed to simply optimists and simply pessimists. But you need to know 
what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and how to work together because otherwise you'll just be fighting a lot and not getting anything done. It sounds like if uh, your uh, wife and my wife got together, they would definitely run that department of evaluation because <laughs> my wife, okay. we, call, we call her the risk assessor. Yeah, there and, you go. Uh, and you and I would just be coming up with uh, with brilliantly stupid ideas. All yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, there you go. <laughs> okay, so so we've kind of covered how there could be some malicious intent, and then there can be honest-hearted people who are really trying their best, but they're blinded by these cognitive biases, and so they're making poor decisions. I kind of want to look at a scenario where you have a company that has hyper growth, things are mm -hmm. going really, really well. Mm. That usually is driven by this uh, visionary entrepreneur who, who yeah. just sees opportunity everywhere. And as the company begins to mature, there's the need for things to change because otherwise the company could, could collapse under its yes. own weight, right? So in your experience working with people in our industry, in those kinds of scenarios, how do you get the team together and how do you develop or, or institute decision-making strategies that help sustainable long-term profitability? So the first thing you do is you need to convince this founder. You all, very often the founder will be this sort of visionary, brilliant seeming person who has 20 ideas before breakfast, right? So you need to convince him or her that they need to get their feet held to the ground. I know that, you know, with my optimism, I need my feet held to the ground because I have done research in cognitive biases and I know that this is a failure of mine. A lot of people who are founders don't. So you need to convince them that this is a problem by giving them examples of, hey, here's what happened to other companies that folded because they were growing too fast and not going in the right direction. They weren't disciplined. This is actually one of the biggest, biggest problems for companies, not being sufficiently disciplined. If you look at the history of small business failure and success, startup failure and success, you will see that about half of all startups fail within the first five years and about two thirds of them fail within the first 10 years. And a lot of that comes at the growth stage at the exact stage that you're talking about. When they're growing to that next stage, they tend to grow too quickly and take on too many projects. And as a result, they run out of cash because there are always going to be some unexpected problems that the visionary founder who is too, way too optimistic doesn't anticipate and ignores people who are more risk aware, pointing them out to the visionary founder and brushes them aside. And then the company gets closes its doors because of very bad situation. You don't want to be in this, that situation. So what I find is really helpful is bringing in other examples of saying, hey, here's how companies tend to fail. This is in my experience and here's the research. So both giving case studies and the research on this topic. And here are the reasons why they fail. Here are the thought patterns and feeling patterns behind why they fail. And here are the decision-making strategies that you need to adopt to avoid failure. This is going to be hard for the founder because the founder has had success uh, going her his own way, going their own way, and now they need to be more disciplined. And discipline is very often hard. So you need to get this person to understand the pain of other founders who have failed and how he or she doesn't want to be in that position going forward. And so once you get this person on board, you can institute effective decision-making strategies, which I discuss in my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, in order to make sure that the company affects and has the best impact going forward in a disciplined fashion that combines creativity and innovation with follow-through. <laughs> as opposed to dispersing its resources on way too many unnecessary projects. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions there. To start with, when you have the opposite problem, maybe the company has matured, it's more traditional now, mm -hmm. it starts to go into decline. I yes. have personally been involved in companies and, and worked with leadership groups where they keep doubling down on the same strategies mm. and things get worse and worse yeah. and worse. How do you reach someone in that, state like how do you talk to them so that they can see what what's going on because it, it just mm -hmm. it, it's crazy to me that yeah. hey this isn't working so let's just do more of it that's just mm -hmm. going to accelerate the problem <laughs> yes you're absolutely right it will accelerate the problem but you're what you're speaking to is you're speaking to their head 
and they're not using their head right now. <laughs> you need to understand that they're coming from a place of fear, from a place of anxiety. They're worried about the future and they're trying to work hard, not smart. And that is, you know, you don't want to tell them that, but you have to understand that that's what, what they're doing. They're thinking that hard work will pull them through and they don't understand that hard work will not pull them through. It will just bring them closer to the precipice. And what they need to do is pivot, change, away from the precipice, away from the cliff. So you need to help them understand, you need to calm their emotions, calm their fears about the future and say, hey, the future can be bright and give them examples, give them stories. Because people, when you, especially when people are in an emotional state, they resonate much more with stories than facts. So give them stories of companies that have successfully pivoted. I'll give you an example, <laughs> a, a story. So there are two companies, well-known companies in the early 1990s, which were looking at the digital camera revolution, Polaroid and Fuji films. Now, Polaroid, you know, for those who remember, you know, shake it like a Polaroid picture, right? And, you know, maybe that ages me. Polaroid was in a wonderful position to go to digital. It's, you know, snap it like a Polaroid picture. It would be a beautiful brand. So that was great. But what happened was that Polaroid analyzed the profit margins on digital, and it saw that digital was going to be a 38% profit margin, whereas its current film business was going to be 60% profit margin. So it decided to not invest into digital, just keep going in film. Well, what Polaroid discovered was that 60% of nothing is still nothing. <laughs> and it went bankrupt in 2001. By contrast, Fujifilm, similar situation. It was looking at the digital revolution, camera revolution in the early 1990s, it saw that its digital margin is going to be much lower profit margin than the current film. But it saw that the future was digital, just as Polaroid kind of saw that, but they decided not to act on it. <laughs> so they saw that the future is digital and they decided that they needed to invest into the future. And so they maximized, they squeezed the maximum profit that they could from their film business, used that to invest into digital, and they're still around, they're still doing great right now. So that's a story of a pivot that was successful and the pivot and a lack of a pivot that wasn't successful. That's the kind of thing that gets through to people because they can see, oh, okay, yes, this is a story of where I don't want to be and this is a story of where I want to be. And that gets through to their fears, through to their emotions. So you want to show them stories of effective pivots. So that's kind of one thing. And the other thing is they did you want to motivate them, but then you want to show them the path forward. So where do you actually want them to go? You already said, hey, change is possible. Where do you actually want them to go? A lot of the time, they just don't have the imagination to actually make the necessary change. So you need to up, get either some new blood into the leadership team or somehow get you know acquisition or something like that to make sure that there is a path forward, that there is new blood, people who can generate new ideas. Because Oftentimes, the old leadership, they are not doing anything new because they don't know how. <laughs> they are used to doing things their old way, and that's kind of what they're traditionally doing. And you know, that's just how they're going ahead. And of course, they won't be able to succeed if that's the way they're going, but they don't know that. And they don't realize anything new, so they just keep doing the old things. In our industry, there's definitely a labor shortage, a skilled labor shortage. And so competent employees don't uh, have that much of a difficulty finding alternate employment. And so if, you're, if your competent employees are one of your greatest assets and they see that the company is in trouble, when they start to leave, that can often accelerate the problem. Mm -hmm. And what is it that you can do as a company to try to help employees through these difficult times and keep you know, retaining those those really good, competent employees who are part of the, hopefully part of the solution and, and are definitely not the problem. Many people will be surprised when I tell them that you should not pay them more money. <laughs> Actually, money has been shown once people are sufficiently compensated and which competent employees should be, it really doesn't motivate people. It's just kind of, you know, this is sufficient, you know, but if you give them more money, they will not do anything else. What you need to do is create a vision of the future that is bright. People leave because they don't have hope for the future. That's why people leave. They, if, if the culture is good and the company, you know, if you're, I mean, if your culture is, good, is bad, you need to fix the culture. But if your culture is good, 
then what you need to do is create a vision of the future. And that again is created through stories. So when I work with companies, one of the things I do is help develop a goal, a vision of the future, and then a very clear story for the company itself, but not simply for the company. That's always something that people often get wrong. They just do a, a story for the company and then they think that that's good. They, you know, a strategic plan uh, combined with a narrative for the company. What you need to do is come up with a narrative for the employees of the company, different categories of employees. How will they specifically fit into this vision of the future? People want to see themselves in the future of the company. And if you just give them the future, you know, the story of the company itself, it won't be motivating. They will not be emotionally motivated. And again, about 80% of our decision-making comes from our emotions, what we feel. So you gotta get those people to feel the right way about the future of the company. And that means that they need to have the right stories in their heads. If the current story that they have in their heads is that the company is failing and they need to find a different employment, well, that'll be a you know, bad story. That won't be the story that will get you out of trouble and that will help you retain employees. If the story will be that, hey, this is a tough time, but let's, you know, slug it out, we'll be together. You know, we are a wonderful team against the world and we will succeed. You know, the people who have been here and who've done this will be very proud to have been here, to have done this and to have been part of this old traditional company that has come into a bright and new future. Again, like Fujifilm, that's a great story of a company that is very successful right now. Or let's say Walmart. Walmart is, again, a great story of a very traditional company that is really successful right now. If there's one thing that you want listeners to really take away from today's conversation, what's that one thing? Don't go with your intuition. Don't go with your gut. Your gut is often going to lead you in the wrong direction because it will tell you to do things that you will not actually get the results that you want. So we talked, you know, the example with employees, the very common thing that is done to retain them is throw more money at them. That does not work. It just simply doesn't work to effectively retain people long term. You want to go against your intuition. You want to figure out what are the actual evidence-based, science-based best practices and use those techniques to get your goals and make sure that you succeed both for your organization and for your career. You've been listening to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. I'm your host, Jamie Irvin, and we've been speaking with Dr. Gleb Sapersky, CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts. Now, if you want to learn more about these science-based strategies, go to disasteravoidanceexperts.com slash nevergut. I've included a link in the show notes, and there's also generously two other links with additional resources for the listeners. I want to thank you very much, Gleb, for coming on the podcast and talking to us about your deep expertise on this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. It's been a pleasure. Have you subscribed to the podcast yet? Go to heavydutypartsreport.com today to subscribe to the podcast. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating and review on the podcast player of your choice. I'd like to remind everyone to focus on cost per mile over purchase price and... Let's keep those trucks and trailers rolling.